right, morning everybody. For those who I haven't met, um, I'm Ahmed Bayomi. I'm one of the second year residents. Uh, I'd like to touch on uh, one of two projects I'm working on this year. This one relating to clinical relevance of the extensor car carpi ulnaris tendon group. For a brief anatomy review, the uh, extensor car carpi ulnaris, or ECU, for short, acts to extend and adduct the wrist. And its tendon sheath is actually thought to be one of the stabilizers of the distal radio ulnar joint. Uh, it actually runs in a groove at the wrist, shown here. Um, and uh, it's actually lying in a separate compartment, sometimes called the sixth synovial compartment of the wrist. And we know from uh, Nakashima and colleagues in 93 that in cadavers, this groove can actually be fairly deep, shallow, or in some cases even flat. So from a clinical standpoint, uh, Inflammation or subluxation of the ECU tendon can be quite painful. Uh, these lesions are associated with overuse syndromes, and often the pain is on the dorsal ulnar side of the wrist, uh, and worsened by supination, as well as wrist flexion and ulnar deviation. Uh, working with my mentors, uh, uh, Matt Iorio and Dr. Jerry Wong, uh, what we'd like to do is characterize the role of the morphology of the group in terms of treatment planning for people who have ulnar-sided wrist pain. Uh, we know that in some patients, uh, synovectomy or even a reconstruction of the tendon sheath can be helpful to address that pain. To this end, um, I'm reviewing uh, medical records from an IRB approved database, uh, looking at patients who have uh, wrist pathology, both radial and ulnar, uh, and uh, doing an analysis of MRI imaging to characterize a few variables that I'll uh, share here. So this is an example of a an axial T1 MRI at the wrist. And the parameters that we're looking at here, the depth of the groove, the opening angle, the radius of curvature, and we're also interested in the width of the tendon relative to the depth of the groove, or excuse me, the width of the groove. Uh, and these haven't been described in the literature previously. Uh, and from our early data, we see that there is complex variability in these parameters. And what we're finding at least from this first set of 20 patients, if you take the groove depth as your independent variable, uh, as the groove deepens, it seems as though the ratio of the tendon to groove width goes down, and that carrying angle uh, actually becomes more acute. So, uh, at this point, we're continuing to build our database of patients who have wrist pathology, and ultimately we'd like to be able to tease out uh, those whose uh, morphology relates to ulnar sided pain, whether that's from ECU irritation or subluxation, or patients who might have an injury to their triangular fibrocartilage complex, for instance. There's an opportunity to do a cadaveric study to further evaluate this. And I'm pleased to share that last month we submitted an abstract to the American Society of Surgery of the Hand, and we're in the process of uh, building a review article for JVJS submission. And in the coming year, Hopefully we can continue this work and continue to develop questions from the database that we're building. Happy to take questions. So are you just using patients with ulnar sided wrist pain or are you also, and I guess A, what are their diagnoses, and then B, is there any control group? Great question. So at this, this first analysis was on patients who have <laughs> wrist pain that includes um, scapolunate ligament tears, TFCC injuries, as well as documented uh, ECU subluxation or synovitis as noted in the OR. So ultimately, the control group is gonna be somebody who, for instance, radial sided pain, or somebody who has no risk of falling, <coughs> who happens to have an MRI within our approved database that we can, we can control for. But the question really is, if somebody has ulnar sided pain, can we attribute it to the ECU subluxing or its sheath being irritated and if so, is that related to the morphology of their groove, which is something that we've seen to be congenital from previous work? So ideally, yes, our control group would either be radial sided pathology or somebody with no, no risk pathology at all. Does the uh, approval that refers to the IRB um, the approval just go back and include patients that are already, uh, for whom you already have studies? Are there any limitations on what you can do? Uh, so my understanding, so these are patients who've undergone operations with Dr. Wong or Trumbull, uh, and I haven't seen the fine print myself, but my understanding is that 
they're, they're approved for MRI analysis for uh, risk pathology. And so uh, beyond that, I can't, I can't say specifics. Going forward, so several journals will require that yes, that these things are approved before you can get a thumbs up on a submission. It's just worth looking at right now. Okay. So if you, if you, well, one, I, I don't think the IRB approval would hold for doing uh, imaging on non, on a control group. So if you're going to go for a different type of control group, somebody who had imaging of the risk for some other reason, if you ended up with the same relationship. So you sort of have a nonlinear relationship with your data. So if you end up with that same type of plateauing relationship, um, would you be able to move forward, or would you have to sort of step back and, and rethink your thesis of what, whether it's a causal factor or just a correlate effect? That's a great question. I think if we are consistent in terms of what we choose as our control group, and I imply that we may be able to use patients with normal risks, but as long as we know that the on our side of the wrist in those patients from the operative reports on our MRI analyses doesn't show pathology, then I'm comfortable saying that we can attribute it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a cause, or excuse me, it's a result of the morphology of the patient. Um, certainly, the best way to address this, of course, would be a prospective study to uh, build another study where we bring patients in who have ulnar side of pain. Um, we an an analyze their morphology on MRI. Uh, and see if, in fact, uh, they develop the same kind of symptoms that we see in our retrospective series. Can you use software that's designed specifically to measure, or this, this is on I'm using, and you're just No, I'm using ImageJ, which is free software available from the NIH, okay. and it allows you to do uh, basic geometric measurement. Uh, and I'm presenting a study that I'm doing with Dr. Daphne Bindgast on an evaluation of appropriate chemical and mechanical prophylaxis for DEBT and uh, PE uh, in orthopedic trauma patients. <coughs> so our purpose is we all know how uh, prevalent uh, DBTs and PEs are and how uh, bad they can be for patients. And the purpose of our study was to determine the incidence um, of these uh, in the patients with uh, orthopedic trauma in the setting of uh, either receiving uh, Golger or guideline-directed DVT prophylaxis uh, in, in our institution. And then the null is that there'd be no difference uh, treated with uh, appropriate DVT chemical or mechanical prophylaxis, if they got it or not. <coughs> uh, so we did a retrospective uh, chart review of patients um, treated by orthopedic traumatologists here and spinal traumatologists over a 70, approximately 72 month period um, who had uh, vascular, uh, studies, uh, either uh, lower extremity duplex, upper extremity uh, duplexes, um, or uh, PE scans, uh, CT PE scans. Uh, the EMR was interrogated uh, using a technical tool uh, for quality, uh, quality tool um, to uh, pull out patients who um, were treated by our uh, orthopedists um, and had those studies, and then uh, information about their uh, chemical and mechanical prophylaxis, pretty much to, uh, the chart was interrogated, and um, if they received chemical or uh, mechanical DBT prophylaxis was uh, ascertained by that uh, technical tool. And so just going through some results, uh, 663 over that period of time uh, patients uh, had uh, studies done, 100 of those uh, were positive, the age range is there standard deviation is 70% male, uh, so they met inclusion criteria for further review. Their uh, injuries were uh, distributed uh, as such. Uh, 63 were found to have uh, DVTs and 49 uh, had PEs. So in reviewing if the patients received appropriate uh, prophylaxis, 54 did uh, receive correct chemical DVT prophylaxis, uh, 46 of uh, the others uh, missed doses because of their procedures comorbid conditions such as head bleeds or uh, direct contraindications. Um, and then of those, 40% uh, uh, 
had adequate uh, mechan well, had mechanical prophylaxis on greater than 75% of the time prior to when they were diagnosed. Um, so what kind of tentatively, you're still cracking the data um, and getting uh, patient factors, but it, it, is, it just, just points out that despite appropriate chemical and um, mechanical DVT prophylaxis, uh, a relatively high rate of uh, patients still do get DVTs and PEs. So just to clarify, so then the goal is just to characterize the prevalence of DVT or PE in a population that's at high risk. That, that that's at high risk and that is did, receiving that is receiving appropriate treatment. Appropriate treatment. Uh, did you parse out whether the PEs were segmental or subsegmental? I did, but it's not up here and we're still going through the data, so yeah. Yeah, because yeah, like some people are now suggesting that subsegmental is better analyzed or don't we should, yeah. we should do nothing but treatment. Yes, yeah, absolutely. No, so it was guidelines. So this was these the patients treated with either the the, the Lovenox uh, or the Delta Parent um, or heparin. So I had to go through each and every it's kind of a, a big <coughs> task to see if they just got every single dose during that period of time. Are you going to try to see if there's differences in those groups? Uh, probably not. I think the numbers would be too low. I mean, so this is you know the stuff that's been pushed on us by or not pushed for us by the. Um, by uh, our pharmacists and who was felt to be appropriate based on the other research, based on like the, the chest um, group that looks at DVT prophylaxis and in orthopedic patients. So these are theoretically approved measures for, for prophylaxis of DVTs and PEs and guidelines by the hospital. We all know those guidelines changed when we felt the parent was too expensive though and we switched to an oxyparin, but still. That's just when you were, so essentially that was the limitations. Well, we were approved for longer in our IRB, but that was the limitations um, of the software being able to uh, pull data. And then what's, I mean, this almost seems like it's well on its way and you'll be done. Is this your long-term resident project that you're gonna present at resident research primaries? Or Hopefully. Okay. <laughs> 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 I mean, is, is there... Penalty for being too efficient. <laughs> <laughs> Slow down. Okay. There's other stuff here. I mean, there's a lot more data that, okay. than, than that I have even to, to go over. Um, but there's still more data that needs to be worked up and more data that needs to be uh, ascertained. So, yeah. Before the prophylaxis strategies were started, what was the rate for the DVTs and the PEs? I mean, in, in spine, like before people got that spine, it was with like spinal cord injuries, which even some of these patients had, the rates have been reported from 50 to 70%. And, uh, otherwise, the normal rate is, I mean, for DVTs is between, it's been reported from 4 to 8% and PEs 4% down generally. With the prophylaxis? Uh, without prophylaxis. Without. With prophylaxis, it's about 4, 2, 4 and 1 for the DVTs and PEs. Just so that everybody can know, like, tell us about how you access using that program for the natural language and so the natural language software is a it's amalgam it's a software used primarily for qi here um, that is run through the qi department and we have that approved clearly through our irb and you have to get approved from them but it it's software that just you you type in your phrases <coughs> like pulmonary emboli and it will and then you have your search criteria and it will search every single you know chart for that uh, same with like uh, for their uh, chemical or their their medication list. It'll search their medication list and it'll search the nurse records as well. And this was something that you were able to do, or you had to get somebody else. No, to I had to get somebody it. else to do. This was this is kind of a uh, in, in conjunction with the QI department uh, and Dr. Beingessner, who's the head of our QI department mm -hmm. here. Um, we were able to get them to run the data that we were looking for as a help as a way to help the orthopedics department in addressing, you know, PEs and DVTs in these patients. 
and like, like it's seeing if they got appropriate uh, chemical or mechanical uh, prophylaxis. You do have IRB approval though to yes. do research on oh, this. Yes, yes, Because yes, yes, did you pay them amalgam? It's my no. understanding you have to pay them so, to do these searches. So that was. That was done under the QI. That was done QI, during the QI, and then we had, a, okay. then we had okay. it approved through our IRB to use that and to use the data. Awesome. So that's an important question. Um, the use of data is viewed differently and managed differently if it's quality control. It is. Are there any medical legal issues that came up with discussing mm -hmm. the ramifications of publishing some, you know, adverse events? Adverse events. Um, I can't speak to that. I, you know, looking at the IR, everything has been you know, through the IRB approval that we can use the analogy software in our IRB and in the data. But looking at, I mean, we have to before we present like final uh, data. This is preliminary data. We have to have to pass through the uh, QI department and the, the legal department to make sure that they, if anybody in litigation, they would have to be pulled. And so on. Okay. Yeah. Another question is: Do you have statistics help? Both for your data and for the eventual comparison between your data and whatever meta analyses exist in the literature. We haven't gotten that far yet. So. I mean, I'd love to have a sense of it. That's something that. I do. That's what she we don't have a lot of time to do already. Exactly. But yeah, so, but we can talk about that. I can, yeah. if, if it's not me, we can find other ways. And, mm -hmm. um, because that was going to be my other comment is you need to consider a multivariate. As, Analysis, analysis and you need to yeah. adjust the comorbidities <coughs> using either Lixhauser or some comorbidity scale charles that yeah. all, all stuff in this is still very yeah. and just one more thing that I was thinking about just for 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 possible compounding variables just with the low molecular weight heparin versus the non molecular weight heparin in orthopedic patients. I know that the differences have been shown for complications of pulmonary embolism embolism in the literature before. So just maybe teasing something out between Patients that just get regular heparin versus. Yeah, yeah, it's it's hard because some of that is so we these are patients also treated in the ICU by the ICU, who's the primary sure. team writing for those things, who have also medical comorbidities, including head bleeds, anything else underneath the sun, abdominal injuries, X, Y, and Z. This is looking at the primary, as I reported, the primary orthopedic injuries that were that were presented. So it, it was really looking at did they receive uh, institutionalized. Uh, approved chemical prophylaxis. Um, 100 patients isn't a lot to do that kind of a multi uh, multivariate analysis between heparin, low molecular weight heparin, enoxaparin, daltaparin, all that stuff. Uh, the numbers I don't think are there to actually be able to do that. Um, so it's really, it's gonna have to be a big blob of DDT prophylaxis. That's all I got. Uh, so the title of my project is Testing for the Presence of Authorship Bias in Peer Review. I'll be working with uh, Seth Leopold as my mentor. Uh, the concept of peer review for scientific publication has been around for many decades, and it really does represent the gold standard way in which we disseminate information and communicate and advance our field as uh, scientists. And while we've made a lot of advancements and people have devoted a lot of thought over the past many decades to making this process as well-defined and as optimal as possible, uh, certainly in a lot of, a lot of uh, areas of the peer review process, uh, there's a lot um, left to understand and there's a lot of variability when you look journal to journal. Uh, one of the areas that still has a lot of variability when you're looking at the peer review process uh, am among journals is the question of uh, blinded authorship during the review process. Uh, currently, as many of you know who have submitted uh, publications to multiple journals, really there's as many policies as there, all, as there are journals. Uh, some journals will blind everything. Uh, other journals will make all authorship data known to the reviewers. Some, um, as in the journal that I'm, I'll be working with, uh, actually let the authors choose whether or not they want to be blinded. Uh, and some, that blind journals, also go through and redact certain pieces of information within the manuscript themselves in order to make them uh, make the, uh, the source of information less obvious. Others stick just at blinding the reviewers' names. Essentially, the point I'm getting at is that there really is uh, um, a bunch of different policies, and it's an important question to think about, at least we think so, uh, because uh, it certainly could, uh, could insert some sort of publication bias and make it more difficult to compare articles from different journals uh, if you assume that they truly were judged uh, and reviewed through the same process when in fact they weren't. Um, when you think about the, the, uh, the possibilities for authorship bias and, and peer review, uh, certainly certain, um, 
certain uh, benefits to having a blinded process or that authors may be vulnerable to bias uh, regarding previous research, perceived expertise, or institution, or uh, um, nationality, or gender. Um, arguments for a transparent peer review uh, usually center around the fact that uh, referees can compare uh, the manuscript in question to previously submitted work by that author um, and recognize potential conflicts of interest. Uh, and that's sort of the question that we're going to be looking at. Um, we're in an interesting uh, and unique situation in that uh, core uh, clinical orthopedics and related research uh, is a journal that actually has for a long time had a policy in which authors are allowed to choose whether or not they'd like to be blinded uh, when their article is submitted to, peer, uh, to, submitted to reviewers uh, for the peer review process. Um, we're going to use that policy and essentially try and figure out a way to determine if whether or not uh, authors choose to blind uh, their work has any effect on publication rates um, and essentially how that affects the review process. Uh, our plan is to draft a sham manuscript uh, with a prominent author group not here. Uh, we've actually talked to some authors who have agreed to lend their name uh, to a sham paper. Uh, and we're going to plant, or we've already planted five errors in that manuscript. Um, our plan is to submit it uh, to reviewers um, without, essentially, well, I will get to the specifics of the IRB, but without their knowledge of what, of what exactly is going on. Um, and look at a few different data points, which I'll get to. Uh, we're planning for a uh, sample size of 120 patients, or 100, 120 reviewers, rather, 120 sample uh, subjects. Uh, that is based on a supposed or uh, predicted acceptance rate of 90% with people who are unblinded and 70% of people who have, or 70% uh, acceptance rate of uh, the group that is blinded. Um, like I said, reviewers are only aware that at some point this year they may receive a fabricated manuscript evaluation, uh, evaluating publication bias. They really have no idea um, what that could entail or um, any more specific than that. Um, and as I mentioned, the current policy at this journal is to allow authors to choose their blinding status. That way, uh, there's no Hawthorne effect, which means that uh, the Hawthorne effect is the idea that people who know they're being uh, studied may, may uh, act differently. So uh, the, whether or not authors are receiving blinded or unblinded uh, uh, data won't necessarily be um, <coughs> different for them or won't you know, pique their interest. Uh, we have three main hypotheses. Um, the first is that the visibility of prominent author names and institutions on test manuscripts will be associated with increased likelihood that the manuscript will be recommended for publication by peer reviewers. It's our primary endpoint. Uh, we also uh, are predicting that the, vi the visibility of prominent author names and institutions will be associated with a decreased likelihood that purposefully, purposefully placed errors in the experimental manuscript will be detected by the reviewers. And also that the visibility of prominent author names and institutions will be associated with increased scores given by reviewers for the method section, despite the fact that these method sections of the experimental manuscript will be identical. Uh, in terms of the timeline, timeline we've already uh, submitted to IRB, uh, IRB um, for approval, and it was approved uh, about a month and a half ago. We've written the sham manuscript, and we've identified authors uh, who will lend their name to this in order to give it uh, credibility. And we've submitted an IRB approved study letter to the reviewer population at CORE informing them that they will be uh, potentially receiving a manuscript uh, for the purposes of quality review. Uh, and our plan is to begin a pilot study uh, within the next month or so here where we submit 20 uh, or 10 blind, 10 non-blinded to reviewers and look to see what our uh, predicted versus actual acceptance rate is and tweak the uh, sort of status or uh, acceptability of our paper in question either to make it more, to make the acceptance rate closer to the 70 and 90 that we're looking for um, based on our initial 20 person pilot study. Our goal uh, after that is to submit it to, uh, or to get reviews from 120 people to satisfy our power analysis for uh, completion of data collection, hopefully uh, by March of 2015. Uh, obviously this, this, um, this uh, topic has farther reach than just specific to the orthopedics field. Uh, so depending on essentially how things go, we may decide on submitting to a more uh, broad-based journal versus uh, something specific in orthopedics. Any other questions? What's your errors, like spelling errors? Uh, <laughs> so we have, uh, that was actually, uh, we tried to make them as diverse as possible. So a few of them are, are simply clerical errors, like a figure quoted in the paper is off by a decimal point or is incorrectly listed in a figure. Um, other things, there's, a, there's actually one grammatical error. And then there's also a few errors. Uh, there's actually one kind of larger error 
in which uh, we make a conclusion that most reviewers likely wouldn't think would be an appropriate conclusion to make uh, with the idea that maybe if prominent authors are saying it, reviewers are less likely to um, call it into question. Uh, so all five of the different errors you know, are, at least in my opinion, pretty widely uh, varied. So do you have to get the reviewers' permission that they can be using the study through your IRB, or is it an opt? Yeah, we had to go through a few uh, iterations of the IRB, um, and what essentially the IRB, what satisfied the IRB and what we settled on was that we submitted a letter to every reviewer at CORE stating that they may or may not receive a uh, fabricated manuscript for the purpose of quality control and understanding bias, uh, and that if they would like to opt out, that they would contact us. Okay, so it's an opt out. Yeah. Has anybody opted out? Uh, no one's opted out so far. Yeah, they still have some time to opt out, um, but no one's opted out yet. I, I, you should definitely be planning to submit this to Lancet, yeah. Chandler. Yeah, um, and that's, you know, certainly it's very, very premature at this point. Um, we have no idea what the data is going to look like even. Who knows, maybe we show no difference. Um, but even in, even if there is no difference, I think that it's still, you know, still something to sign a report. Um, but our, our definitely tentative goal is something, you know, more broad. I think it's hugely interesting, and at its basic level, you're sort of assessing whether whether some reviewers are influenced by the prominence or lack of prominence of of the authors, and I mean, there's a huge amount of evidence that even gender uh, has a huge influence on mm -hmm. on reviewers' output. My my question is whether I mean. My experience is that there's a small subset of reviewers that probably have those biases, but the ones that do have those biases have very strong biases. So do you think that your pilot study is going to be robust to the potential that you may just have one or two people out of that 20 that are influenced? Um, and whether, whether there's another strategy to try and capture maybe a greater percentage of those so you can sort of fine tune, uh, have a better chance of fine tuning in the pilot stage? Um, sure, and you know I think there are, that's a definitely a legitimate concern, and you know we may not get everything we we hope to out of the pilot study, um, but also at minimum uh, something that you know one of the major things that we hope to accomplish with the pilot study is uh, our sample size of 120 really is dependent on making sure that this is accepted or rejected at a rate similar to what we predicted. So even if the pilot study all say even if the pilot study shows that all 20 people, regardless of uh, blinded versus unblinded say, publish this thing, we know we made the sham manuscript essentially too good. Um, so even if we're not able to glean some nuances of bias from our pilot study, uh, if we can at least get an idea of if we need to make the manuscript more or less appealing in order to tease out any differences if they are there, um, I think that'll, that'll be helpful in and of itself. But, but you know, you're right. Um, we, it's something that we, we may consider increasing the pilot study, and that's something maybe we should consider. Uh, we also, uh, getting 120 people to review it without um, you know, uh, reviewers starting to realize that a lot of people are getting the same paper um, uh, may pose tricky as well. So we're also trying to balance uh, getting enough reviewers um, without folks truly, you know, understanding or not realizing right. that something's going on. I mean, I guess I was sort of fishing for maybe um, without biasing your approach. Uh, I mean, having having done editorial shift at journals and knowing a lot of people that, that are in Seth's position. They have a pretty good feel for who uh, is unbiased and who isn't. Mm -hmm. And um, if you're doing a pilot study, I mean, for the main study, you can't you can't do that. But for the pilot study, I think you have a little more license scientifically to maybe pre-select a little bit and um, see if he, you know, based on past experience with reviews, uh, you could identify maybe a subset, a ten, ten and ten that you think, and see if the results conform confirm what you're thinking in terms of the hypothesis might be a way of sort of isolating um, a difference that might not be there otherwise if you just randomly picked one. Yeah, that's, in that's interesting. I'll, I'll um, you know, sort that out, but that's, that may be a good idea. We're going to see if we can. How are you selecting your 120? Are you doing a simple random sample? Or we are. Yeah, our, our, our <laughs> policy right now, or our, um, our plan, is to uh, submit it in batches, uh, small batches, uh, to people at random uh, until we get 120 um, responses. We need to, we're, Really, we're only halfway, right? Three, four, yeah, not even. So, okay. 
So mine should be quicker just because I don't exactly have a project yet. I have several questions that I've been trying to find faculty mentorship for, but I think my first idea, which was to do joint registry level research, is probably not going to pan out necessarily just based on the lack of uh, clinical faculty who are interested and the fact that we don't participate in a joint registry. Um, so I'm still sort of looking into using a couple of the national databases, but I'm not sure that's going to work. Um, my second idea is to do registry level research with the trauma database, and I think that there is some support behind that, but I haven't exactly uh, developed a question yet for that. I'm sort of thinking about looking at uh, hip fractures and the way that the kinds of hip fractures that we're seeing are, have been evolving over the last decade or two. Um, possibly, since that's been studied by other people, to some extent, maybe looking at pelvis fractures and seeing if the kinds of pelvis fractures we're seeing are, are changing. Um, my last idea is just to, again, use the registry or use um, some hip fracture data that's already being collected and uh, determine what the change in functional level, level is before and after um, surgery for a hip fracture is stratified by the operative intervention that's chosen. Um, so methods I, I don't exactly have, but the registries I was looking at for total joints, um, the one that might still be possible to use is the most registry. Um, which is, um, I think, mostly focused out of a couple centers in California. Uh, and the data is available for anybody to use, but again, just because we're not participating in it and not really finding faculty to help develop a relevant question. Um, so, may or may not work out. Um, Sorry, can I just interrupt? Yeah. Do you know, are there still folks with whom you work at BM with doing cell joints? Yes. Like the yeah. And there's mm -hmm. another resource, potential resource. John Clark, who used to be on faculty, is coming back in the capacity at least as a fellowship director or some sort of educational um, relationship. But he would either <coughs> have access to the people for sure. Yeah, I think Virginia Mason participates, but none of the people we work with are potentially. So if he's coming back, or if they might be able to drop in the line. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, because that, I mean, that's my primary interest. Okay. Okay. okay, yeah, thanks for that. Um, so I think for the time being, I may start looking at the trauma registry until I can find somebody who might be more interested in that kind of uh, work. Um, so well, if I'm I sorry, hard chance to. <laughs> yeah, I just, I thought about asking him over the last month, it seems like he's got a lot on his plate. Wow. <laughs> 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 so I'd be delighted to do this. Decided not to. They'll still do it. None of the VM guys? No, okay. no, they don't. They, we don't participate in the registry, and so. Because um, I think we just approved as some like uh, center for joint replacement, like Walmart is sending all their people because they have all these super high. Um, I can't remember what the name of the, the thing that they were approved of. Maybe the joints guys know a little bit yeah, more about the joints field. You're right. They, they won the contract. They're one of four centers that are doing Walmart's uh, ACO. What's that? They're probably an ACO. Yeah, so like they're sending Walmart it because they have such high, uh, great patient outcomes, I guess, in in the nation. Like they were one of four centers that was chosen. Um, Walmart will actually send their patients from all over the country to VM to get their surgeries done because they have such high outcomes. I would also say if you want to do like registry level research yeah. in like total joints, yeah. uh, that I I don't know how easy it would be. It would probably be a little bit more challenging. But there are faculty mentors at other institutions that are worth looking out for, um, and it, you know it's hard to, to sort of create a relationship out of scratch. Right. But I think it, it, you know, if you express an interest and you're willing to do the work, a lot of these people are, are really prolific in terms of what they do. Like a person who comes to mind is uh, Kevin Bozick at UCSF, is a guy who I know does research with people at other institutions, and is really, I mean, he's like. He is, if you want to get something published that's meaningful, he's a guy well, who could do that. I guess, so I worked with somebody when I did a sub at Stanford who was interested, uh, in, totally involved in the AJRR. But I just didn't know how that would be viewed and how that would work I think out. if you, you give the people here an opportunity and if they don't want to be involved with you, then I don't think that they can tell you one way or another that you can not go search for mentorship outside of it. Have you, you, have you, have you, have you talked to Navin? The new guy no, no, I didn't even know about him today. So, I mean, it might not be unreasonable to find somebody for else. Uh, they're going to to have to yeah. reduce some sort it's of. I think it's part of the problem, though, is that we, our institutions don't participate in the registry. So it would have to be through an outside institution or, what, I don't know, what what data, data. What numbers are available with the most registry? 
they have a ton of data. It's, a ton of data. <laughs> it's uh, data on clinical measures. Um, I think well, you can access it without a faculty. I mean, you, you can, can get the data, but I agree. You want some faculty I need mentorship. faculty membership yeah. to, to probably the relevant question that hasn't been answered before. I don't want to just start blindly and sure. like, delving into all this data that's available. Have you contacted the <coughs> folks? Like any addition? Such as? Clubo, uh, McDonald. Um, no, I talked to Dr. Leopold and um, uh, Dr. Manor and ask for recommendations on, you know, can we get involved with the registries and um, who should I talk to? And they said this, they essentially said this is a dead end, that they've tried to get involved with the registries and that our, we haven't. I think the VM guys do more research than we give them. Like, I don't know a ton about it, but from what I understand, um, they do a ton of research over there. Um, so they may be really interested. You can email Bill Parrott. I, Bill, Bill Barrett, Bill Barrett is involved Valley. in research. He publishes. At the Journal of Arthroplasty, he reads a lot. Yeah, and I would also contact um, Clabo and McDonald at VM. They're both, they would be, if they're interested in doing research, it would be just great, great, yeah. they would be a great resource. And they would maybe be able to offer you more advice about registry stuff. And then uh, Bill Barrett, I would be surprised if he's not involved in some sort of registry. Okay, and yeah. he's, he's interested in working with residents, he likes residents. I think, yeah, I think my number one goal is to uh, get involved with registry level research. And if yeah. that's some joints, that'd be ideal. If it's not, I mean, I'm happy to work with the trauma registry. I don't want to have to go through Stanford just to do joint registry research. But yeah. Contact us to see if they are involved in registries. Cool. Yeah, that's very helpful. Um, so I have a lot of needs at this point, but <laughs> that's actually answering some of those. Needs. I think that's about probably all I have to say. Yeah. Thank you. All right, my name is Alex Lauder. I'll be presenting on uh, my research project, which is a functional analysis of bridge plating for distal radius fractures. Uh, I'm working with Dr. Wong and his group and Dr. Hannum as well. Um, so the question is, does surgical treatment with the dorsal spanning bridge plate um, impact long-term functional kinematics of the wrist? Uh, we have lots of data on volar plating, dorsal plating, uh, but not so much on kind of this dorsal spanning bridge plate, which is a uh, method really kind of pioneered here at Harborview. Um, so kind of some background on that dorsal spanning bridge plate. It's been described in the literature for use in uh, unstable fra fractures, polytrauma, on patients that need to uh, mobilize early with platform weight bearing, uh, bilateral, severely comminuted fractures, and complex injuries. Um, the way it's done is the bridge plate's temporarily placed for about three months and then it's removed at about the three month mark and the patient is allowed to start doing range of motion and grip strength exercises. Um, and again, we have lots of data and there's been many meta-analyses on these outcomes, uh, just functional outcomes on patients with uh, volar plating, dorsal plating, and external fixation, but we don't have any similar data on uh, those with dorsal spanning bridge plates. Um, so our objective is really to determine, determine kind of the functional outcome between one and four year follow-up, um, comparing to their basically the contralateral side. Um, and then we can kind of give some descriptive statistics, do a comparison with the contralateral side, and then um, suggest uh, comparison uh, from what's published in the literature for volar plating, dorsal plating, and external fixation. So our design is a prospective uh, data collection. Uh, all patients in the last four years, aged 18 to 75, uh, who underwent uh, a unilateral procedure with operative fixation of the distal radius fracture. Um, and then we're going to invite them back and collect functional uh, analysis with uh, flexion extension, pronation, supination, ulnar deviation, grip strength, extension torque, um, and then see how they're kind of doing as far as outcome scores as well with, some, with three standard uh, small surveys. Um, the statistical analysis that we'll be doing is basically just simple descriptive statistics for um, kind of functional uh, outcomes, and then we'll, we will be able to compare to their uh, non-operative side as far as uh, whether or not they have a decrease or relative increase in, in grip strength in this, those measures. Um, so needs and timeline, the goal is 20 to 30 patients, just as kind of a pilot uh, as there's no data on this, um, and then the goal is to try to get a couple clinic days, uh, have all the data collection done by this June, and then submit something by, by the summer. Uh, Dr. Wong is uh, the major faculty mentor, but um, Dr. Agnew and Dr. Uh, Allen are, are helping out as well. 
Uh, we're looking for hopefully journal hand surgery, uh, depending on how our outcomes, you know, kind of go. And uh, intended audience is really anyone who treats distal radius fractures in this type of setting. Uh, here are some resources on uh, what's in the literature regarding this. And, uh, that's about it. Kenny. My understanding is, I think it's a great project. Several people have tried to do this in recent years. I think we're important when it gets done. The, how, I think there's been an issue with how the IRB works for getting people to come back to clinic. Uh, and especially if they come on clinic, like on a clinic day, and if sure. the insurances were to get charged for a visit that they otherwise wouldn't have. Sure. So we're doing it as a kind of a standard follow-up visit. What we're trying to do is work with the institution to see if they can waive their institutional fee. Um, that's becoming a little difficult. We're also going to look into some grants um, to see if we can help uh, support the patients. This could be a really good, if, if the institution defaults, I mean, this could be a really good example for like an a, a, a SSH resident yeah. grant or an OREF. And we're looking into this. Because, you know, that would be enough money to kind of pay for the clinic that visit or something yeah. like that. And we're, we're also scheduling it on off uh, clinic times, yeah. usually Friday mornings when uh, there is no otherwise any, there's no other uh, hand patients being seen at that time. So. Uh, that was going to be my comment because, too, if you do go down this route, you know, you can't bring people in. It's a, it's a good lesson for everyone. You can't bring people in for research purposes and then have their insurance charged for clinical sure. reasons. And there's a whole process here um, that, that you set up a research account and that research account gets billed. And um, I agree with Kenny, it'd be awesome to do a study like this, but we have institutional limits yeah. and funding and is a big issue. We're working with them right now. So. I know we're trying to move along, but um, it's important to consider the type of fracture as well. Sure. Some of the folks that get steered towards the surgery like may have a significantly more complex injury than the result of the loss of the Sure. All right, thanks. All right, Kelvin Schlepp. I'm uh, going to be talking about one of the projects going on. Uh, this is a trans bicylindral nail fixation in adolescence, so with tibial shaft fractures. I'm doing it with Dr. Blaine Basically, the background is there is uh, only really one study that's actually looked at this, and particularly looking at the safety of doing this in patients that have open vices. And it's Court Brown, 2013 or 2003, uh, in England. Uh, the problem that's very different from their study is, uh, well, first of all, it's only 36 patients. I'm not saying we have a whole bunch more, uh, but they specifically modified their start point to avoid damaging the physis. They dropped it uh, lower and anterior uh, on the front of the tibia. Um, Basically, their results show that they did damage the physis despite doing this, uh, but uh, also didn't demonstrate any problems with any um, delayed growth uh, or damage to the growth plate. There's also a bunch of other, other literature for other things, particularly ACL reconstructions that uh, are done in this age group that cross the physis um, that are pretty reassuring that this is going to be safe. Uh, and then uh, there's, some, there's some literature regarding curatage of tumors that involve the physeal area and the damage that's done to that and how much patients can tolerate. So uh, we basically proposed uh, looking at our retrospectively at the cohort of patients that are done at Harborview, um, specifically looking towards the safety and then doing a full review of uh, um, kind of all outcomes of this procedure. Um, patients we're looking at now are 13 to 16 year olds with uh, tibial shaft fractures uh, that were treated uh, with a rigid uh, nail. Um, there may be some changes to the, I've been thinking about this a lot, how I want to actually finally consider my cohorts, because we have the ability to have a matched cohort, or we have the ability to compare this to patients in the same age group that have both devices, um, that had the same procedure. <laughs> Timeline won't take too much, too long once I actually start sitting and waiting through all the x-rays. And the target journal is probably JOT. Is, Talk to some people about the journal Pediatrics, which is probably not a very good option because they will be very interested in having like full long leg films to actually confirm the presence of uh, growth disturbance uh, more accurately than just a clinical exam. And the budget is basically uh, nothing but coffee for me to review x-rays. Um, outcomes, the primary outcome is uh, gonna be uh, requiring an additional procedure uh, to correct malalignment or uh, leg length discrepancy. 
Um, multiple secondary outcomes basically related to the clinical functional outcome, as well as evidence of time to union, um, additional procedures for other reasons, which will become important if we choose to use a cohort that uses other, other means, because they often require additional procedures. So I've been able to pull through the Harborview database basically the patients and kind of wade through my numbers to see where I'm going to be able to get. So we've done 124. Um, that's 13 to 16 year olds, sorry, since 2000. Um, 78, 78 of them have been uh, rigid instrumentally nailed across the physis, and uh, 58 of those have open physis. Um, multiple limitations to this, which I'm trying to work through. Um, long term follow up is always a problem with the RBU studies. Um, so, through the retrospective IRB on the omnibus, I can access children's records. So, I'm going to try and um, cross reference all these patients in order to get long term follow up. We've we'll also talked to a number of people about adding additional centers. Um, talked to Ted briefly, and then Mark Miller is interested in adding some patients from uh, Wash U. And then um, coming up with a final study design. <coughs> um, basically, it's whether or not adding additional cohort and turning this into a retrospective cohort study is worthwhile. Because if we're looking purely at safety, it's not really necessary to than other than to report our case series. Um, but I think that uh, we could show some benefit or encourage the use of instrumentally nails when you start adding in other types of treatment options and <coughs> the requirement to take out flexible nails or to remove plates in the future or other potential options. You know, there's other benefits to doing a rigid instrumentally nail towards like union and weight bearing, et cetera. Um, any questions? Is there actually, I have a question, is there some known instance of trouble after this with future closure? And no, it's really just theoretical. So how are you measuring safety? Um, that would be basically, well, safety in such that requiring another procedure to, to fix the limb alignment uh, or malalignment problems. Um, being the, the, the risk that we're most concerned about is damage to the growth plate. So far, it doesn't appear to actually occur. I think that's a good. I think that's a good outcome because that maybe is what matters most for patients. But if you want to like have some, I think that probably that rate is probably low. You know, yeah. even if they might need it, they might not get it. Or, or from here they don't get it. Yeah, and certainly from here they don't get it. So like, you know, even on malalignment, even just having it as a secondary outcome, is certainly what I would like some kind of malalignment or something radiographically you can get. You know, to compare to literature in the piece that says, oh, people with this degree of malalignment, we tend to do another yeah. surgery on, yeah. might just be helpful as a way to kind of help you get, you know, get the data that you can get. We're going to try and get that data, yeah. just whether or not it exists. Full length length length. It don't exist. Bro. I'm, I'm worried that you're going to spend a lot of time looking at children's and trying to correlate the data, and you're not going to get anything out of it. Like, I've kind of done, tried to do these projects before with tumor patients back when I was a, a kind of a medical student and resident, and it was like a huge, huge time suck, yeah. like hours and hours and hours. And it's like paper charting. So I'm just, that would be my concern, that you're gonna like spend a long time like reviewing these, whatever, 100 patients, and then you're gonna be like, gosh, that was a huge waste of time. I have nothing to show for it. Well, especially when the best objective data that you could have would be limb length films with a contralateral limb, which we're not, we don't do here. And, yeah. and we don't do the secondary procedures here if they're going to have them. So then, you know, if, and who knows where these patients end up because they go to Montana and Idaho and other places, not just Seattle Children's. Yeah. I mean, I think that it's an interesting project. We have good numbers, and so it's pretty enticing, but trying to get the data that you want and the outcomes that you want is going to be really hard, and I don't know, and I think that's going to be the main problem. Yeah. But if you could, if you could design it in such a way that using the data you can't get here is enough for some kind of interesting project, mm -hmm. and have that be something you focus on next year, be, and then maybe try this more ambitious project, but know that your time horizon might be longer. Mm -hmm might be a way to do that if you're really interested. And, and, but you're right, like my LA children's thing is gonna come faster and faster up. You know, next thing you know, we 
know, I would feed the link those down there and Mark Miller's looking at those so we can get try to get more numbers from those two different institutions. So that I mean the best way to do it is to use those guys at a specific children's institution where they do this procedure and have mm -hmm. the limb-like films. Because mm -hmm. we're level one trauma centers. Both of those hospitals are level one trauma centers that take care of PED stuff, so it's it's a little different than you know, our Seattle Children's that isn't a level one trauma center. Mm -hmm. I mean, Seattle Children still sees tibial fractures, uh, tibial fractures as well. So yeah, but when's the last time you treated one with an intramedular you know, for crisis? Not very often. <laughs> but I know if we've looked at what numbers they have <coughs> as well. Okay. Let's yep. uh, my study is looking at uh, digital arterial injury and lacerations of the hand and figuring out if using a pulse saw can get a good idea to see if there's been an injury to the digital artery or not and whether they need to be transferred to a level one trauma center or area where they do revascularization procedures. Our hypothesis is that uh, if you do have a digital artery laceration, your pulse ox will be lower. And what we're trying to figure out is, is there a value of that number that we can use that can say, you know, if you're below this number, your chances are this high of having a uh, digital artery injury. Uh, I think the good thing about the study is that pulse ox is available everywhere. I mean, I know Dopplers are too, but they're not as readily available as pulse oxes. And everybody knows how to use them. They can feel pretty confident in just sticking it on the finger um, rather than I've seen people not know how to use a Doppler before. Um, and it's just something that seems feasible for most emergency departments, even if it's not at a level one trauma center. There's really no <laughs> literature looking at this. There's a lot of looking at pulse ox for flaps plastic surgery and to see if the pedicle falls, pulse ox drops, but there's not anything really in the hand literature. So how we're going to get the data is kind of what we're sorting out right now. Um, we've kind of made a clinical decision to just start doing this um, for clinical reasons to see if, you know, just another data point, stick a pulse ox on the finger. We already do it with Doppler. Um, anyway just to see what's going on and we're keeping a database so we can see how many patients that we we need um, but the question is really everybody who has an injury to their hand and the exclusion criteria would be anybody who doesn't go to surgery because then we don't know if there was a digital or real laceration or not. Are you expecting this yeah. to only be different if both arteries are on? Right yeah and that's kind of yeah exactly something that would require it to be revascularized. So the technique is basically just putting uh, pulse ox on the, on the digit. We'll take a couple from the same hand and then from the uninjured hand to get a kind of an idea of what, you know, what the pulse ox measurements are. Really, it's just the time to collect the data. Um, we need about 40 uh, fingers uh, to kind of get a statistically powerful um, result and it's just taking time to kind of get the injuries. It's busy in the ED. We can't always get the measurements. Um, you know, stuff moves quickly, so it's just kind of the time to get all the patients. And then the faculty uh, member is Dr. Friedrich. We're also working with Dr. Iorio Kenny um, on the project, and it's you know American Side Surgery in the Hand or even some of the ED literature. If you have just volar injuries. Um, there is preservation of some dorsal circulation on a non thumb digit. Um, out of curiosity, what pulse ox readings are you seeing now in your sort of pilot um, So, usually contralateral will get anywhere from 98 to 100. And for the ones that have where we've gone to the OR and had to do a revascularization procedure, they've, they've been in the mid 80s. We've, ne we've never had an injured finger that required revascularization or amputation be higher than 92. Yeah. Ever. So, yes. Yeah. It might be, I'll just say that every once in a blue moon, I remember early on getting somebody from Yakima that had sent over with a bunch of late tenants. And oh, by the way, all eight non thumb digital arteries have been out for a week, and he was just fine. So, I'm never one to say that something's got to go. Got a challenge right. for clinical significance, but it's important to think that not everything that's cut is going to completely kill the finger. Right. Those guys may be more prone to certain. We like to be more prone to tolerance, but um, you should think about what use might be made of your data down the line. Yeah, that's the that's the right now. Okay. Uh, talk with Teresa. Okay. Okay.
All right. <coughs> so I'm doing a project with Dr. Firuzabadi um, on antibiotic bead outcomes. There is very little literature to support um, whether or not to take out beads or to leave them in and to see if there's actually complications that arise from that. Obviously, you're going to have a, um, an additional surgery if you have to take out the antibiotic beads, um, which can cause comorbidities to the patient, and it's unknown at this time if that's um, significant enough uh, of a need to take out the beads and if the patient's going to have a problem. So we aim to provide data to support the management of, um, we're specifically looking at antibiotic beads, not spacers, um, placed at a fracture site. So uh, previous literature has looked at soft tissues and um, osteomyelitis, which is included in some of our data, but more specifically, we're also looking at acute fracture placement and contaminated wounds. Um, our hypothesis is that there's no difference in outcomes between patients that have uh, planned removal of the antibiotic beads or if they're left in. So this is a retrospective chart review. Um, we have been IRB approved. Uh, our inclusion, actually, it's going to be over 18 because we are excluding um, minors. And then they have to have a fracture, an acute fracture, and then a placement of the antibiotic bead, not a spacer. And then patients, um, so one thing that's a variable for us is making sure that patients that have um, stage procedures or are undergoing um, some type of reconstruction procedure in the future are excluded because then they're automatically going to take the beads out. Um, and then our primary outcome measures are if in the, so I've been reviewing all the um, post-operative notes and the operative reports, and usually at the end there's a post-operative plan or in the clinic notes it says plan for bleed, uh, bead removal. Um, and of those that do uh, go on to bead removal, we're looking at the outcomes of that and what the wounds look like in clinic and following their follow-up time. And then looking at those that weren't planned on being removed and whether or not those are removed and why they were removed. Um, so right now, I there's probably 300 charts that I've been going through. I've gone through probably 200 and there's only 30 or so that have met criteria. And then I'm just through the data collection point. Uh, there's a lot of measures that we're recording, including whether or not it's an open fracture, the type of combination of the fracture, the site of the fracture. Um, this arose somewhat from Dr. Peru's body places them sometimes in pelvic fractures, and he was talking about it with Dr. Clevino, and Dr. Clevino uh, typically will remove the beads, and that's a pretty morbid thing, having to go into the pelvis to remove those. And Dr. Peru's body leaves them in, and so that's kind of where our project stemmed from. And then our submission uh, kind of points there uh, for an abstract and then hopefully a journal article target, depending on what our data have? shows. What's that? How many patients do you have? Um, total right now, I'm going through about 200 charts, uh, probably only about 35 or so. Do you, do you have enough just pelvis fractures? No, no. Um, I haven't really, so we started back in 2004-ish, and so I haven't gotten up to the Feruza body years yet. Um, I'm waiting for that, or, um, yeah, and Dr. Rout didn't, like, there's very few cases where he used antibiotic beads. But there are, I would say, more often than not, the plan is to keep them in unless there's planned reconstruction surgery. Um, yeah, and there's only been one kind of symptomatic one that I've come across where the beads were poking out through the skin. That's going to be difficult because it's unknown whether or not you plan for the, or if it's an unplanned removal, you can't blame the uh, like surgical site infection on the antibiotic feed placement being there. So I think that's something we're going to have a difficulty um, kind of explaining. But it's just kind of outcomes and to say whether or not it's safe to leave antibiotic feeds and or not. How are you defining wound healing? Have you thought about that? Yeah. So looking through the follow-up clinic note and just uh, there's a previous study that we're kind of basing this off okay. of, which was chronic osteomyelitis patients, and they described like four different variables in their paper, which was including erythema, drainage, and wound approximation. So all looking at their last follow-up clinic note. Yeah. How are you gonna define safety? It seems like the mechanical trouble that can be caused by these or the, um, the wire is gonna vary 
so you can go to the site, mm -hmm. and I think that they end up getting so quickly, that's not like a long term problem. Mm -hmm. It's just more going back. It's more the going back and the wound complication. Um, it's going to be hard to compare the different surgical sites because we don't have enough numbers in each currently uh, to be able to say one more than the other. Obviously, it's going to be less systematic in a thigh versus a tibia or a forearm. Is there any, I should know this, is there any biodegradable vehicle that's used now to deliver the LinkedIn? Um, just the vancomycin powder or something like that, but not the actual cement beads themselves.